So next topic um, will be from Gabriel Müller, um, IPv6 in the cloud. I'm really looking forward to this presentation because as Anna said, um, quite some enterprises um, do now have some plan for IPv6 and of course also have plans to move more stuff into the cloud. So it's a really relevant question, okay, can we leverage our IPv6 approach for our data center um, in the cloud as well, so I'm really looking forward um, what the answer will be. Well, I mean, I have a feeling, but uh, let's see what uh, Gabriel has to say, and then without further ado, uh, the stage is yours. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks for being here. Yeah, well, the question is if you're going to back to square one or not, and um, this will be basically the scope of this talk. Uh, this is about my company, about myself. I'm. Um, Living in Switzerland, originally I'm from uh, Germany near Cologne, but then I moved to uh, Zurich to, to study at ETH, and now I'm living uh, close to Zurich in Winterthur with uh, two kids and my wife. And I'm working for AWK now for uh, nine years now as a project manager and uh, net network uh, expert uh, supporting our customers in various projects. Okay, so motivation for this talk was that um, uh, it was last year in autumn, um, I was talking to a customer and he said, oh, well, we, we're very fascinated from this Azure cloud and uh, we, we're really considering to move more or less one of our two data centers into the cloud. And I said, hey, perfect, you have to readdress everything or you have to address everything so you can do this with IPv6, right? And then uh, in the afternoon I went home and said, hmm, let's have a look. And uh, basically this was the motivation for, for my talk today. Um, as you can see the agenda, I will give a quick introduction to more or less a cloud definition uh, to also to uh, make you aware in which area we're talking today because cloud is quite, uh, quite a broad um, area to, and you could spend, I guess, weeks to talk about it. Uh, then I focused on uh, four, let's say, cloud service providers and looked what they can offer with respect to IPv6. So there will be a quick demo. And I also would like to discuss if, um, if this kind of um, implementation, which I'm now reporting about, uh, is really the way to go in general. And I'm really excited to have this discussion later on then. Okay, so this is a definition about cloud computing by NIST, which is, I think is a very good one, even it's already several years old. And this makes up good definitions, to my understanding, if you have a, a definition which uh, persists over time. And what the um, NIST uh, definition is uh, emphasizing is the network access. So this would be a justification for me to, to have network access over IPv6 as well. And uh, for this introduction part, what is important to realize that you have uh, five essential characteristics of cloud, three service models, and four deployment models, which we briefly will now discuss in this introduction part. So um, the essential characteristics, as you can see here, it's on-demand uh, capability, and you can do it yourself. So it's not that you have to call some cloud provider to, to, uh, to get some resources. You have a broad network access, so emphasize again on the, the network access. Um, what is important to understand is that uh, usually you, you share these resources, so the resources are not um, owned by or explicitly assigned to you. Um, with some uh, cloud providers, you can request for dedicated computing resources, but what you have to understand, the, especially the, the network infrastructure, this is. Uh, to my understanding, always shared with other customers. Um, you, you are able with this rapid elasticity to, um, to scale, and this is um, very important. I, had a, I heard a very interesting uh, talk, and uh, it was back uh, at the Chaos Computer Club, I think three or four years ago, where the Obama IT guy was reporting about um, that uh, for the election campaign, they used uh, cloud infrastructure and it was perfect because they could scale from uh, zero to uh, infinity more or less uh, very easily. So it was, uh, if they had low demand on resources, they used only what they needed all the time. This was really interesting to hear. 
And obviously, uh, because cloud service providers uh, need to make some revenue, so um, there must be some measures to, to uh, monitor, control, and also uh, invoice uh, the services you, you, you use. Then um, we have the service models. And uh, in the NIST um, definition, you only have this, um, the, the lower three um, parts, which is infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service, and uh, service as a service. Um, there's a very good book, which is uh, the details you can find in the, pen, uh, in the appendix of the slides, um, which introduces two additional um, service models. One is uh, about um, information as a service. It's uh, about provide and or process information. And the other one uh, is about uh, deliver business process to your, to your organization. And uh, I think this is some, some kind of obvious that um, the higher you go, the less uh, control you have over the, the data, right? Because especially in the information uh, as a service model, you give the information aware, uh, away to, to some other entity to process them. And um, the, with, with this, also the, in, uh, the service provider access to the information increases. Um, so then we have the deployment models, which uh, I think at least most of you would have heard uh, all of those already. So you have a private cloud, which is not very interesting, at least not in the scope of this presentation, because this is a cloud you maintain on your own, in your, with your own data uh, or data center, with your own infrastructure. Uh, the same or uh, similar to community cloud, which is uh, restricted to some um, to a, to a, to a limited uh, user or audience. And then we have the public cloud, which is uh, basically what we are talking today about. And the hybrid cloud is a mix of uh, the three first uh, cloud uh, deployment models uh, to use. Any questions so far? Then, um, yeah, well, what you do if you uh, need to select some uh, cloud prov service providers uh, to look at, so they are. Uh, a lot of service providers. There are also some service providers which, which do not uh, hold the definition of NIST, uh, so they don't uh, fulfill some of these uh, characteristics. But I was then looking at um, Gartner, and uh, you know this uh, famous magic quadrant, and I selected um, the, the four leading, uh, let's say, cloud service providers. Um, this is the definition of cloud uh, uh, service providers from uh, from Gartner themselves. Also, they um, have some characteristics which more or less m matches the NIST uh, definition. And uh, also, they emphasize again the network capabilities. And again, for me, network capabilities um, as of today would be uh, also IPv6 should be supported. So the, this magic quadrant. Um, so what I selected for this talk was. Um, I selected Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Alibaba Cloud. And um, I think the provider maturity, I don't have to go into detail, because this is uh, quite some kind of obvious how they are uh, ranked. Recommended mode, to the best what I understood from Gartner, is that mode one is more the, let's say, the classic approach. And uh, mode two is more the, as, a, as a, they say it themselves, the agile approach. So, and this is for me it's Google, right? So Google has um, is not the, the, the classic classic uh, provider of that kind of work. Um, before I started with my analysis, I was thinking what I want to do, and I came up with a very uh, let's say uh, easy network diagram, let's say. So um, I wanted uh, to build some IIS, so infrastructure as a service um, topology, um, setting up a network within this topology, having some uh, gateway to the internet, having some routing and switching infrastructure within my, my topology, and having uh, some basic, very basic services such as DHCP and DNS. Um, So um, then we would already come to the results. So uh, 
first one would be I did it alphabet alphabetically, so no justification. <laughs> so first Alibaba. Um, I always um, the first uh, slide always shows you the the entry dashboard so, so that you get an impression of how it looks like. Um, and to say it straight away, so they have no IPv6 support at all. Um, nevertheless, I will show now uh, several slides because it gives you a good, uh, let's say, basic understanding what in this typical infrastructure as a service environment, um, which uh, key components you have. So um, basically at the beginning, when you set up such an infrastructure as a service, let's say network topology, or also most of the um, service providers call it, it's a VPC, the virtual private cloud, uh, and this relates to the network uh, setup you can do here, um, which gives you the possibility here, since you don't have any IPv6 support, to define a, uh, an RFC 1918 uh, network and uh, use this then uh, in, the, in multiple subnets and uh, using chunks out of this network to, uh, to configure, let's say, subnets or layer two switching domains, or whatever you call it. Um, yeah, this is more, some more details about this. Then you have the, the virtual router functionality. Obviously, like in a, in, a, in, in a router with layer three functionality or in a firewall, you have all these directly connected networks, right? So all the sub internet uh, sub, uh, sub networks you create within this VPC. What, what this routing table is uh, also then used for is if you, uh, for instance, uh, connect uh, some VPN connect, uh, network uh, to this uh, virtual cloud. So if, for example, if you have a data center within your organization, locally homed, and you would like to, to communicate bet between the cloud and your DC, you will set up uh, uh, some sort of VPN connection. And then, of course, it's quite important to know the remote, uh, remote uh, routing information, right, to access the remote networks. So then you have this uh, V switches. It's basically the, the subnets you create, and for each subnet you create, you will get this uh, vSwitch uh, infrastructure or zone. And uh, then in, at the end, when you then set up a, a computing um, or VM virtual machine or computing instance, as they usually say, then you connect to one or more of these uh, subnets, uh, this VM. Um, Exactly. So, ah, then you have also the obviously, especially in the case of IPv4, when you have a private address space, uh, it, it does not help a lot to to communicate with the outside. So you you then have uh, the uh, possibility to assign public addresses, and um, most of these vendors have two flavors of doing so. So you can have a they, often they call it elastic IP, and this IP is not bounded one-to-one -to, -one to, let's say, a, a virtual computing instance, but often then is terminated on a, on a load balancer or might be related to a one-to-one uh, -one net to a, a private IP address of an instance, but this elastic IP you can very easily move to another instance. So if the instance uh, goes down or you, if, if it's a scheduled main uh, down, down to downtime or not, whatever, you can migrate this elastic IP very easily, which helps you to, to keep up the service provided by this IP. And the other one is uh, more um, the, the static IP, which you basically assign one-to-one -to, -one to this uh, computing instance or the network interface of this computing instance. Um, and this, by, by tendency, is then used to um, for outgoing connections. So if the, the servers in your, um, in your VPC need to, to get some updates or for whatever reasons to connect to the outside, they, they use this uh, more or less static IP. And this static IP often then also is uh, removed as soon as you tear down this computing infrastructure, you, uh, you lose it and it's not, it could be assigned to another customer right away afterwards. So elastic IP, you have more control over it, I would say. Um, ah, NAT gateway is also very, um, very important functionality. So f for in inbound connections, you could, um, as you know it, uh, you could do this destination NAT to, to terminate or to forward the traffic to some uh, computing instance within your VPC. 
and uh, yeah, you could also do a destination a source nut for for outgoing uh, connections. So uh, yeah, and then you have the obviously load balancer to to um, load um, the load of uh, the tra incoming traffic load to uh, multiple instances of your VPC to to be able to um, to uh, compen or to to accommodate the load. And what is, uh, as I mentioned before in the introduction, all these cloud providers uh, offer very uh, advanced uh, functionality to to uh, create more instances more or less on the fly. So you can set threshold values on CP or bandwidth or whatever. And as soon as this threshold is uh, um, uh, overstepped, so a new instance is uh, auto more or less automatically provisioned and uh, attached into the network for to and added to the load balancer for handling the additional load. And the same applies when the load decreases. So to summarize, uh, as I said in the beginning, I would like, I wanted to show you the, the let's say the building blocks of such a VPC, because we now see it in all the other three uh, service uh, cloud service providers. And um, as I said, also there is no IPv6 support, and um, of course, you, you at least I I then asked the support, hey, I, I would like to have IPv6, and the recommendation they made. Uh, they told me, look, you have this computing instance with this, some Linux box, so you can set up a, a Hurricane Electric tunnel, and then you have IPv6. Yeah. Well, it's nice, but uh, for, let's say, moving my data center into the cloud, uh, I would not uh, rely on this one. And uh, I also always ask if, you, if they have a roadmap, and uh, also I can also tell you right now, the answer was, I'm sorry we don't have a roadmap. Uh, please look at these uh, websites for, for further announcement. Uh, and they also don't have an, uh, a roadmap for IPv6 at all in, in the VPC. Yeah. So this is what about uh, Alibaba. Next, uh, Amazon. Uh, it's by far the most advanced uh, when it comes to IPv6. This is the dashboard, which uh, I really like because you see, the, as you can see, the recently visited services. So you're very quick in navigating through your, through your VPC and all the other components of it. Um, yeah, and also, as you can see here, you have IPv6 support. So as soon as you create this uh, uh, VPC network, you can uh, state, yes, I would like to have an IPv6 uh, space. And then you get a slash 56 assigned out of the um, out of the Amazon uh, IPv6 address range, and so you can then um, use up to obviously up to uh, 256 uh, slash uh, 64 networks uh, in in your VPC, uh, which is quite nice. And um, so I will also share the slide so you don't have to take pictures as soon, as long as you don't want to publish it now. Yeah, there's some uh, examples. So I, um, this is uh, the, the, the IPv6 uh, space I got. OK, it's me. Oh, so it was. Uh, OK, the so IPv6 uh, range I got uh, assigned. No, uh, but you see, I'm not used to it, so I uh, should practice in advance. <laughs> OK, um, next, what is next? Yeah, and then you could see that I have uh, created two subnets, and I got a subnet allocated for each of this um, subnet, uh, an IPv6 uh, slash 64 allocated to each of these uh, subnets. And uh, yeah, then you have the routing table, which obviously now also includes uh, the slash 56 uh, network. Then you have the, yeah, this uh, was the first uh, disappointment that you cannot uh, specify IPv6 uh, domain name servers, so DNS servers, they cannot be specified, as I always did. Uh, I asked by when this is available, and I said, yeah, um, this, there seem to be other customers which would like to use it, so it has already been uh, escalated, and they are currently working on the implementation. But once more, yeah. Is it doable in IPv4? Well, you can, you can, uh, this so is. I mean, is. Can you configure the HTTP v4 for your VPC with a DNS server? 
Yeah, so this is to, to give uh, DHCP options, right? So in the DHCP uh, offers that you the specified domain have, and you can enter the IPv6, IPv4 addresses, obviously. Yeah. Otherwise, and that's working. Yeah, that's working. Yeah. May I chime in for one question? Yeah. Um, the prefix we have seen in the VPC, the IPv6 prefix, yeah. um, is this pre-allocated from Amazon, or, yes. or can I choose whatever prefix no. I want to use? No. no, you have to use uh, Amazon prefix or uh, space. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um. Sorry, I have a yeah. question. Uh, how big? Uh, how? Um, what is the minimum prefix size? I it's, it's there's only one, which is slash fifty six. Okay. So I asked them. Uh, I intend to say it later, but I can say now. So I asked them. I I wanted to have uh, let's say uh, slash forty eight, because slash forty eight is if you have a if you have a data center, so you so slash forty eight for for a site is quite common, right? And this is also what I recommend my customers. So I asked them, can I get a slash 40 and said, no, it's technically not feasible. And I could issue a feature request for this now, which I didn't because I don't have the, the real need for this. But I told them, look, there might be customers coming and they have the slash 48 in the DC uh, in their premises and now they want to do a, let's say, more or less a one-to-one -one setup in the cloud and then it would be really nice to have also slash 48 to, to, to reapply your address planning one-to-one -one and not uh, struggling around with, with having multiple VPCs maybe connected because this was one of the recommendations they gave me. They said, well, you can set up more than one VPC and interconnect them via routing. And for a slash 48, I would have to set up 256 VPCs, so yeah, and all the routing table maintenance, so no. And uh, yeah. Okay, what I also looked at was uh, DNS, and uh, I had a special focus on um, PTR. So first, what I did always, I, I uh, allocated, uh, let's say, uh, this is muelega.net, this, this is my domain, and. Um, uh, I delegated a sub sub uh, domain to to all these uh, cloud service providers, and um, this was working easily. And um, I could query all the A and quad A records from any public DNS server. But I then ah oh, wait the, here you have also the all this um, all these types which are supported by Amazon. Um, but I was uh, specifically inter interested in uh, setting up a reverse uh, DNS uh, entry because this is, for example, if you uh, utilize or you're operating a mail server, this is a lot of uh, sending mail servers. Oh no, the receiving mail servers look if they can find the reverse, uh, can see uh, find a host name for this IP source, uh, source IP address. Uh, and so I, I tried this, and you could actually do this. So. Um, Obviously, you could very easily do it in the in the um, DNS uh, in the zone 53, as they call it at Amazon, uh, or DNS 53. Um, you could do it in this internal DNS server, but there's also a form on the website at Amazon, and then you can ask for this reverse po uh, pointer entries, and then they set it up in there because this needs to be set up by the owner of the IP addresses, right? And uh, so then they set it up for me, and uh, afterward it was it was working from uh, even my my company company DNS servers. He could reverse look up the the, the host name or the quad A record for this uh, IPv6 address, which is quite nice. And it took them nine hours only to to set it up for me. So I issued the request, and nine hours later, it was uh, they confirmed that they have implemented it. Uh, as I mentioned already in the Alibaba uh, introduction, this uh, VPN topic is also an important one because as soon as you want uh, to to uh, intercommunicate, for example, between two data centers, you, you need this. And it's also not available with Amazon. So um, uh, they have already feature requests for this, so I, I assume they will pretty soon in, uh, support this as well, which is needed, to my opinion. Yeah. To, to summarize, um, as I said, also by far the most advanced uh, Amazon with regards to IPv6 support. Uh, no DHCP v6 support yet. Or DHCP, uh, no, it's not a DNS. Sorry, there's a typo. DNS, I thought I fixed it in some slide. 
So it's uh, DNS. And you have, as I already um, answered uh, to you, Christopher, it's uh, this slash, or you, I don't know, this is a slash, slash uh, this fixed slash 50 side, and you can only have, uh, let's say, you cannot give them um, the, your IPv6 address range to and routing it to this uh, cloud. This is not possible at all. And here's again the statement they, they wrote to me about this, uh, what I can, how I can uh, circumvent this uh, slash uh, 56. Um, uh, boundary, but uh, it's not even even assured that you get a consecutive uh, IP address space. So, uh, yeah, for me it would be not usable. Okay. So, one bag for you. <laughs> okay. Next is Google. So uh, this is the dashboard of Google, which also lets you e navigate very easily. You have also you can set up this um, your your. Um, recently or your frequently used uh, functionalities or subsets. And uh, yeah, so there's also, as you can see, no IPv6 here anyway. So it is not there. And then what you do next, you Google. Yeah? You Google what I care, how IPv6 uh, Google Cloud Platform. And then they say it's possible. You have to use um, a load balancer. So. Um, you then can define an IPv6 address on which terminates on the on the load balancer, and this is how it works. So you terminate uh, IPv4 and IPv6 on the load balancer, and within the Google or within your local or your VPC, you only use IPv4. And then there's obviously then there's NAT64, which, for example, if you have an HTTP uh, traffic, it um, yeah, it um, forwards the traffic uh, to the target, your computing instance within the cloud uh, via IPv4. And um, as you can see, um, they support quite a lot of protocols, so not that bad. Um, uh, and especially if you're operating, a, let's say, a web server, you might be interested in um, who is connecting. And obviously, if you have this NET64, every time uh, the source IP you see, which is connecting, is uh, the load balancer and not the, the source IP of your customer. And uh, what they offer, for example, for HTTP, they're adding a, in the HTTP header, in the, uh, I don't know, GET request or whatever, they add a header, which they call X forwarding header. And there you can see um, the IPv6 address of the of the load balancer where the traffic terminated on and also the source IP address, IPv6 address of the customer. Um, ah, this is the same. So um, you have this uh, external, um, this elastic IPs, and they call it not elastic but e ephemeral. And uh, the, similar to, to Alibaba, as you, you could have then. Um, um, use use them to to uh, to connect uh, your internal, let's say, computing instance with an IPv4 address with uh, with uh, with a public internet. DNS uh, again, so you could set up this uh, a rec uh, quad A record uh, for the load balancer, but uh, there is no support for PTR on IPv6. So they support it on IPv4, but they do not support it on uh, IPv6. Yeah. And uh, yeah. there's not even a. Yeah, so I could uh, follow up a block to, to, to see when it's available. Um, yeah, well, I said um, nothing to add to the summary to what I said. Uh, the last one is uh, Azure. Also very nice GUI, which easily lets you navigate to all these things. And there's also uh, no IPv6 support. Um, this is their statement. Uh, what they implement is NET66. So similar to what you can have with uh, Google, you can have uh, having the load balancer terminating uh, IPv6 and uh, using another IPv6 uh, address or address space to, to then internally translate. 
before we go to the details, um, what I really liked is um, this uh, web-based PowerShell. So you could, uh, you obviously you can, uh, you can with your local PowerShell installation, you can log in via, let's say, shell to your cloud with, with all the cr security credentials. But after you had uh, logged in into the web-based portal, you could start a PowerShell browser embedded, which is, I really liked it because you can really easy then uh, work on, uh, and there are certain commands you can only issue via, via, the, um, uh, via the PowerShell, and we are not, which are not available in the, in the GUI thing. So um, as I said, they're using Net66, Net66, and um, there is one example, so again, if you Google for setting up uh, IPv6 in Azure, which uh, is a very complex example where you have first to even set up this whole load balancer infrastructure with multiple virtual machines in an availability set. And it's all uh, CLI based. And I love the CLI, but uh, I'm not familiar with the Azure CLI. So uh, I was looking for other ways to achieve this. And basically, the only thing you have to do outside the GUI is to, um, to create a virtual uh, machine um, in the command, uh, in the CLI, and attaching a an, uh, network interface to it via the CLI, which has enabled IPv6 support. This is the only step you have to do. And all the other steps you can do in the GUI. And uh, in the appendix, you can find uh, a detailed step-by-step -step, uh, guideline how to do this. OK. Um, yeah. So uh, again, the DNS check mark. Um, yeah, you can imagine that, um, similar to Google, they do not uh, support uh, uh, reverse uh, uh, DNS for IPv6, only for IPv4. Um, summary, yeah. What, what I, I have to admit, I did not ask as a support, but I, I, I was thinking, I'm not sure if support can answer this at all. But I'm, I don't understand why they implemented this NAT66. NAT64 with Google, I can understand. So if you don't have an IPv6 in the, in, the, in the internal VPC, OK, then you, you translate to, to another IP version. But using IPv6, uh, NAT66, I don't get it, the motivation for that. Um, yeah. So um, the big picture, very familiar, or very similar to the picture <coughs> I showed at the introduction. I, what I now added, given the results I found, is that I added this uh, load balancer, because uh, you can only achieve it uh, via load balancer at some point in time. And then uh, um, yeah, I stated where you have IPv6 support for all this uh, different uh, cloud service providers. And um, as, to, as you recall, most efficient or most sophisticated support is uh, with uh, Amazon Web Services and on uh, yeah, Microsoft Azure and uh, Google Cloud Platform. You only have the way to work with a load balancer, which I really uh, think is not the way to go. If you really, it's it's like this uh, first first uh, or this uh, quick quick win uh, implementation of IPv6. You implement or deploy IPv6 on the edge, right? And then you're you're accessible via IPv6. But uh, on the on the long run, if you if you really intend to move a whole data center into the cloud into such a VPC uh, environment, I, I would not do it because then in a few years time I have to touch it again uh, and readdress. And there was some guy uh, in, before today which says, do not readdress. It was more meant for IPv6, IPv6. But same would apply for IPv4 to IPv6, I would assume. Um, yeah, and um, oh, this is some comments. Yeah. As you know me, there's always a demo in my presentations. So, um, so what is the time? Oh, we are good. Huh? Very good. <laughs> There's another feature today, okay. coming later. Okay. Um, so first, what we could show first. Too many connections. <laughs> uh, 
okay, this is better now. Okay, let's close this as well. Um, so what we can do? Oh yeah, this one. As I mentioned, in the case of uh, Google, yeah, this is a side which, um, where's my Ah, computer, this one. Um, what is really nice, well, it's nice from a user perspective. I'm not sure how nice it is from a security perspective. Uh, you can connect via the browser to the compute instance. And as you can see, uh, it's in German. SSA key uh, is going to be transferred to the machine. So they have access to my private key now. OK. <laughs> so uh, as I said, it's a nice, really nice from a user perspective. Yeah. And uh, so this is now my uh, a computing instance, which I just installed the default uh, Apache configuration, or, and uh, yeah, you can. So you see, there's only a, a private IPv4 address, and yeah, I'm also yeah, you see from where I'm connected now within the Google, and what we could do. Um, so. I'm now going to, um, this is to show you this uh, X forwarding entry. So I'm now, uh, this is, let's see what is used here. Oh, nothing. Good. Ah, demonstration effect. Very strange. Ah, this is, now it should work. Yeah, you see now here in the X forward. Can you read this, by the way? Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, so you see this is, um, to Christopher, it looks should familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a two pass network, and this is uh, the IP address. Uh, the connection was terminated on the load balancer. And uh, yeah, if we, I'm not sure if I can, uh, this, well, this is now also, I guess Google Chrome is now using. Ah, no, he's, for whatever reasons, he's using IPv4, I don't know. Uh, but uh, you see now the, the public uh, IP of the Troopers uh, router and the, the IP of the load balancer, the public IP on the Google. So this is what about this. Um, what else I wanted to show? Well, exactly. So we have, um, for Amazon, we really have this um, dual stack support. Um, this is, is it too small or can you read it? So here you really have um, um, a global routable uh, oh yeah, wow. Can see the global, and you can also access any uh, um, external IPv6 resource. <coughs> yeah, so Is it really, yeah. Um, so, what is, yeah. so the really cool thing I cannot show you today because I s prepared too late, it was about that in, in Amazon Cloud, you can um, have, on the Amazon Marketplace, you can have various uh, appliances. And one of these appliances is a virtual SRX a Juniper firewall. And uh, I was able to deploy it into my cloud, but I was not able to connect, especially not via IPv6. But uh, this is uh, really nice. And this is a very really good uh, also. Um, marketing idea because uh, people like me, which uh, currently um, administrate our SRX firewall in, in, in our, let's say, local data center infrastructure, uh, if you give them such such tools uh, at hand, they, they, know, they know it, uh, they, use, uh, they know how to use it. So it's quite a smart move from uh, such companies. Cisco, you can have also Cisco ASA and everything. So a lot of uh, such appliances are virtualized and uh, can be used in the clouds, also with Azure and so on. This is not restricted to Amazon, necessarily. 
Anything you would like to see? If I'm just, I'm locked into all clouds, so any? Ah, that's a good one. It will, it's, it will only, it will not work with uh, ICMP tracer as support yesterday told me. Um, uh, yeah, they're using some TCP tracer. I'm, I never used that before. Now they said, uh, well, I have some. I can show you the mail later. From the external. Uh, uh, I was trying when I set up the virtual SRX, I was trying because I was troubleshooting and uh, try um, But it will not uh, finish. And I don't want to display the email now here, but he sent something in the support ticket. Can okay, in parallel. No, it's if you apply for, uh, I did this testing, so where you get free whatever, one year and so, and this is uh, with also, I think also with Azure, that it's always in, in the main region, so in America, Ohio, I think it's here. And, uh, and, uh, let's See, oh, it's just <laughs> not reachable at all. Wait. And uh, he used some TCP. Can you know this? Uh, I don't know the command at Windows at least. I don't think that Windows. Trace, uh, no, Windows okay. only supports ICMP based trace routes. Uh, it's my new company laptop. I don't have the VM, Ubuntu VM now, so not yet. Anything else? Otherwise, I would come back and uh, restart uh, or continue with the discussion. Uh, yeah, this was not discussion. So, um, as I said, I know no no posters today, but uh, given the time and it's only 15 minutes to lunch, I brought some chocolate to give you some sugar. For uh, uh, hand it around, please. <laughs> Just it contains nuts. Someone allergic to nuts, don't don't eat it. Okay, so discussion for me would be um, especially especially for companies uh, my size, so a small medium enterprise. Should you really go for infrastructure as a service? Because it's a lot of hassle to set up. You need a lot of uh, knowledge. It's quite different to set up things in the cloud compared into uh, with your data center. So uh, should you really should you really go for infrastructure service at all? Because you can all have, especially the Windows stuff, you can have all this active, active directory, uh, uh, SharePoint, Skype for Business, you can have all this in the cloud. So why should you Wouldn't it be easier to just purchase it as a service, uh, as a service uh, from this catalog they all offer? And uh, only if at all restrict, let's say, the, the infrastructure as a service usage on, let's say, um, self-developed applications, um, things you cannot get out of the catalog. Would this be a, another way, a better way? I don't know. And in addition, if you operate, especially if you operate as uh, on infrastructure as a service, you, you're responsible, right? You, you're getting this uh, virtual machine image, but it's more or less naked. So there is nothing, uh, no security updates, nothing. Only if you go for a platform as a service, you, you might get it, because then they, uh, the cloud providers usually take care about, uh, let's say, the operating system part. But in the infrastructure as a service part, it's your VM, and you have you're responsible for it, and this includes also the security part. And uh, yeah, given all these uh, complex uh, constraints, I was asking myself, where's the benefit to to use uh, the infrastructure as a service uh, environment, whatever? Any comments?
I mean, I could make a snarky comment. It doesn't take two weeks to get a server deployed when you're using ISSS. Uh, but if I purchase, I, I have to admit, I never purchased any service as a service. Does it take two weeks? I, I would say, assume it t takes also. Well, I mean, in the uh, typical large-scale enterprise environments, there is some time associated when you need a server and when you get a server, especially when you have a third-party provider uh, responsible for deploying um, this server. It ah, might no, take a no. couple of weeks. No, I think we're talking about two different things. I was saying, instead of moving my service, because at the end you offer some application or some service to the customer, internal, be it internal, external, and uh, instead of doing this in the infrastructure as a service in the cloud, you do it still in the cloud, but you purchase the service uh, on a, let's say, on the application level. So you, you purchase from Microsoft the SharePoint server, and you, you just configure the, let's say, the content and the application level, and, but you don't set up a Windows server in the infrastructure as a service environment, uh, then installing SharePoint on it, and then uh, uh, another server you're running the Active Directory, and so on. So in, this I meant. Of course, I know, I, and I also recognize this is, if you really, if you need or you, you need a server, it's, it's a few mouse clicks and the, the wheel is spinning a few seconds and then boom, the server is there. This is really attractive to have this in the cloud compared in just what you said, that in, in, uh, even if you're virtualized in your, in your local data center, at some point in time you need to uh, maintain, you need to increase, so you have to touch metal, right? And this you, you never do in the cloud. And what I also recognized is that on um, infrastructure as a service, uh, the pricing model is as such as that you pay usually some, some fee per operational unit. Uh, so every hour it runs, you pay, depending on the, the, the size of the virtual machine, for example, and you pay for traffic. And this is regardless if 10, 10 uh, users using the, the SharePoint application or if it's one user. And in the in the service as a service uh, pricing model, it's, it's usually that you have a price per user, regardless if this user is transferring 10 gigabit data to the SharePoint or, or 2 megabit. And uh, it's, it's, it's very, from the, let's say, OPEX perspective for the company, it's very easy because they, they, they most probably even have a estimate how much they grow in the next two years and they can uh, very well uh, uh, estimate the, the OPEX costs for, for all these uh, uh, services then, yeah. No clear pro and con for any sentiments. Well, where I can yeah, see. I can <laughs> only state um, I, mean, I, I agree with, uh, especially when it comes to uh, Microsoft based services, mm. the Microsoft, say, aligned or integrated offerings are yeah. much better than um, uh, running the stuff yourself. Infrastructure. Uh, systems, but I would say in our customer space, uh, there's many people still going for infrastructure as a service, as they are under the illusion that it provides them flexibility, and uh, we can do it the way we have done it before, well, just, uh, you know, virtualized data center running in the cloud. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if people are yet there. Yeah, I also... From their, from yeah, their yeah, operations yeah. models and their, yeah. their mental images. That's, uh, that's the main thing from a yeah. technical rationale. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Yeah, it was a, what you what you said was good that uh, they assume that it's very similar to what they have in the local data centers. And uh, especially we can be, when it comes to uh, monitoring on network level, I would uh, totally disagree because as far as I know, you don't have the capabilities to, to query some of these virtual routers via SNMP for some statistics. And um, you, on, let's say from the application perspective, you have a lot of tools to monitor the health of your application in the clouds. But uh, this does not necessarily show you if, if there's some tech, attack ongoing, especially on network level. So uh, for me, there's some missing feature, let's say, that uh, how, how to, to detect some uh, um, yeah, malicious uh, activities on network layer. 
Okay, so um, it's me in between you and the, the lunch break. So, uh, so any more questions regarding the IPv6 support or general questions, Eric? A typical deployment we see now in private data center yeah. is to give a slash 64 per host so that each container can get its unique v6 address. Ah, if you have this container. So like, yeah. is it any way to do it with those cloud VPC? Uh, I would have to check, but uh, I would say, for now I would say no, because um, I think both, yeah, well, it's only in Amazon, and what you then, you, uh, the host is configured, or the VM is configured in that way that it just requests, and the, the IP is assigned via DHCP v6. Mm -hmm. And well, I could I could uh, try to to uh, change the configuration to requ uh, request a prefix delegation, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't try to be honest. Yeah. Or static. Yeah. Or stat static, it's not possible. Static, it's uh, it's not possible. So Amazon assigns it via DHCP v6. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I use IPv6 uh, network RCLs in Amazon? Yeah, yeah, you can have uh, security. This is, uh, didn't I show that? Uh, you can have the security, they call it uh, security groups, and I, I, I think with uh, both Azure and also Amazon and, um, um, and uh, Amazon, you can attach such uh, security groups to the network interface, basically. And you can, uh, yeah, you can uh, layer three, four, like uh, yeah. protocol port. Let me, maybe I can quickly show one example. Um, security groups, yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, here for example. Not sure. So you have inbound and outbound rules. We and, can't uh, see anything. Oh, so this is very smart, yeah, sorry for that, Windows P. Uh, Duplin now it's better. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, not a good example because it's only V4. Let's check another one. Uh, um, this is also not good here. I don't have anything. Ah, this one, I guess. Uh, yeah. No. Just want to show you something with. Uh, IPv6. Uh, yeah, this could also be work then. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so great. Um, uh, test. And then he can also assign the VPC which it belongs to. Here you can uh, say, uh, for example, all ice in PV6, and you can say very secure, right? And safe. And this, in turn, you can then uh, apply to the virtual network interface on the VM. And you, when you create a VM, you can also define default uh, security groups. And uh, they are automatically create, uh, set or assigned to the VMs. So, if you, especially if you automate all the scripting and everything, this is very nice. And yeah. I know you had a question <coughs> or a comment. I just wanted to comment that uh, I do not necessarily share. Elegantly sneaked in a typical way of assigning a slash 64 to a host. Uh, um, you might recall there was quite some debate in the ITF if this is a smart idea. But for container deployments, it makes sense. Okay. Hmm. It also replaces all the layer two issue because you don't do layer two in the end, right? You do routing only. So don't forget about road arrays and anybody who's going to be able to do that. Yes, but uh, creates a state elsewhere. Yeah, of course. And we can have the debate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's lunchtime, so um, okay. we can do the discussion during that. Any more questions? All right, and thank you very much, Gabriel. Very interesting results. <laughs>